chapter 6. This is chapter 6, right? Yes, chapter 6. <coughs> Excuse me. So, when it comes to cultures and, and you know, all the things <coughs> that are relevant, right? A lot of the things that we know about other cultures... Uh, hey, you guys. Hey, there's this great new invention. It's called a whisper. If you have to talk, normal volume is just, like, not going to cut it. If you have to share, I know you're just so excited about geography. If you got to share something, whisper. <clears throat> um, we're on one side. Oh, well, yes. Uh, well, this culture... This chapter we start talking about culture. The next three chapters are all about culture, cultural change. Um, cultures, there's a battleground between cultures all the time happening all around us. Uh, this chapter starts off talking about how, <clears throat> well, most of the things that we know from ancient societies are, are things that are their artworks that are left over, right? Uh, a lot of other things, uh, a lot of cultures did not have written language. Uh, some that did doesn't mean all the documents were saved or that all the documents were even uh, produced that would cover every aspect of that culture and that society. So a lot of it is <clears throat> people much later trying to piece together, uh, looking at kind of info that's, that's, well, communicated via that art, right? And, and writing, obviously, right? For societies that had writing, um, and plenty of societies didn't uh, even until relatively recently. <clears throat> All right, get icebreaker. All right, some definitions. Culture. Beliefs, values, practices, behaviors, and technologies shared by society and passed down from generation to generation. Right, a lot of these very ephemeral, right? They're very temporary. They seem in, in the lifespan of a human, they seem to be the meaning of everything. They seem almost eternal. Uh, but a lot of this stuff is just culturally <clears throat> here today and gone tomorrow, right? Cultural trait, material and immaterial cultural attributes, things like language, arts, land use patterns, personal behavior, food clothing, shared cultural practices, basically just everything, right? Everything humans do, <clears throat> things that have meaning. So some specifics. Uh, you know, you've probably heard some of these before, artifacts. Uh, you know, when movies are talking about historical objects and whatnot, they'll talk about them as artifacts. Uh, visual objects and technologies that that culture created. <clears throat> um, a lot of these are, are all over our cultural landscape, as it's called. Cultural landscape is just the landscape that humans have done something to. Uh, and this is an increasing amount of space in, in our world today as humans just increasingly kind of take over everywhere and shape everything according to, to well, their personal or their so social values. Social facts, structures and organizations that influence behavior, right? So these are kind of like social machines that we all create, right? And we create these social machines and then these social machines recreate us, <clears throat> right? Generationally, uh, educational systems, religious organizations, governments, families, all kinds of large kind of, as I said, social machines whose product is all of us and the way we think about things. Uh, Metafacts, elements of culture that reflects it shared ideas, values, knowledge, and beliefs. Uh, main ones being language and religious beliefs. That's why these next three chapters, they all have a little bit of a focus on language and they all have a bit of a focus on religious beliefs. I don't know, from journal activity. <clears throat> Changes in spread of culture. Um, <clears throat> well, we saw one from Dennis Germs and Steel, the invention of agriculture, and how that spread through physical space. Uh, people who left the Fertile Crescent brought it with them. Uh, and then 
those ideas continued to kind of spread around the world, uh, even if the individual people didn't. <clears throat> Human forces, um, you know, cultural norms change all the time. You have very often generational change. You'll have a society that just completely decides to, to go a different route than the previous generation before them. Uh, and that's happening increasingly as the world is becoming more interconnected. Uh, people are kind of seeing more perspectives uh, and kind of gaining a broader awareness. And this isn't just in the US. This is actually every place that has, well, a good internet connection, basically. Uh, which is, again, that's uneven geography, but that's spreading out. Uh, technological forces, well, as I was saying, improved communication. Uh, it's making it so that people are, the, the earth is getting smaller through time. You can think of it that way. <clears throat> Map here from the book, while well, looking at uh, the internet in different countries, um, they didn't go into a huge amount of detail as how they categorized whether uh, internet access, whether it's considered open and free, whether it's considered partly free, whether it's considered or not free at all. It kind of depends because, uh, well, when I go to these countries, you know, uh, when I went to China and also when I went to Egypt, I had read a lot about the censorship of the internet, uh, but it really depended. <clears throat> when I was in China, actually this is before uh, we were going mobile on our phones uh, as much, and so I would go to different internet cafes, and I would just kind of, out of curiosity, type in New York Times and things like that. Uh, and I was surprised to find out that it usually worked. Uh, I think the deal is, well, I think it, I, <clears throat> it was at the time difficult for China to uh, kind of monitor everyone's interactions online. And I think it was more of a random chance rather than, than showing the kind of freedoms or whatnot. When I went to Egypt, there was a similar thing where it kind of depended where we were. Um, at that point, I did have internet on my phone, and when I would try to do things on the phone, it wouldn't work. But when I would go to different people's individual logins and places, things would work. So it's kind of like, it's tough to map these changes and whatnot. I believe this map is based on specific policies by these different countries. Uh, and you know, it's, it's controversial because a company like Google, uh, which uh, in general, consider itself a, a company that helps people communicate, uh, but it will block things if the Chinese government wants it to block things. Uh, and these can be things about uh, democracy movements, all kinds of different things, right? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Popular culture versus traditional culture. When we talk about how cultures are kind of fighting uh, and they're kind of contesting space. <clears throat> well, the, one of the most well-known examples is how popular culture kind of pervades a lot, right? Especially since popular culture in general is more, well, younger generations tend to key in more on popular culture and kind of global trends, larger trends that are happening, whether these are fashion or whatever. Um, and this as opposed to traditional culture. Uh, lots of places around the world, uh, their cultures are, let's say, more traditional uh, than popular. They have, based on older beliefs and practices, behaviors. <clears throat> um, I think one of the reasons that the textbook uses this picture to kind of exemplify this point uh, is because, well, you can see the, some folk architecture in the background, right? You have uh, a couple Buddhist monks here. Buddhist monks very much uh, you would tie to uh, traditional culture, older cultures, older way of doing things. Uh, whereas the popularity of basketball, uh, it's very much, although basketball is now international, uh, a lot of that popularity was geared by the US uh, and people watching basketball here. Uh, and aspects of that culture that have moved in, uh, you know, this isn't exactly the kind of traditional monk uniform necessarily, right? Uh, and so we see in one picture the kind of the, the fight between that, right? Even the vehicles are an aspect of popular modern culture that are kind of getting their way on the landscape there. Attitudes toward
towards cultural differences. <clears throat> a couple more terms. Um, ethnocentrism, tendency of ethnic groups to evaluate other groups according to preconceived ideas originating from their own culture. Right, this is a typical example of everyone wherever they are, although we have a huge diversity of types of people, types of lifestyles, but everyone wherever they are tend to think that theirs is the one correct one, right? Um, and these, these can be minor things, these can be large things. Uh, <coughs> cultural relativism, evaluation of a culture solely on its unique standards. I would say an example of cultural relativism would be well, you'll hear people uh, make arguments about child labor, for example, right? Child labor, which is pretty universally considered to be uh, something that is usually outlawed in places, uh, but you will get arguments uh, from people saying, well, in this culture, it's just different. And then you'll have a critic who would answer back saying, well, it was different here until we outlawed child labor. Like, you make a thing a norm if you want to. You make a norm or make it not a norm depending on your laws that you pass. If you have laws in a place and as long as they're enforced, uh, you, you change your culture that way. Uh, when it comes to kind of cultural norms and whatnot and the geography of it, uh, I always like to use this example uh, because it's one of those things where, well, like I said, people just feel like you do things the right way where you live, right? <clears throat> when people, how do people in this classroom, when you talk about soft drinks, soft drinks, you say the word soda? Who says soda? Oh, people say soda? Who says pop? Pop. All right. Who says, no matter what it is, Coke? Could be a Pepsi Coke? Could be a root beer coke. That sounds really unusual, right? Uh, well, there's little maps on, on the standardized use of these different terms. Um, it, there are other things that have similar geographies, like uh, you know, if you call your refrigerator a fridge, if you call it an ice box, these are usually uh, well things that are that are cultural cultural that are just in specific places, kind of depending on what was popularized. Uh, <clears throat> do people know internationally it, it, what's more popular, pop or soda? It's mostly soda, and it's mostly because this region here and this region here make all of our TV shows and movies. And so those regional variations, uh, so when you travel, uh, when I do, I had to kind of unlearn uh, saying pop. And I got in the habit of, that, of saying soda pop, which people still look at me weird, but at least I got the soda word in there, so they, they, they actually know what I'm trying to talk about. Another map kind of showing the same stuff. All right, all right. <clears throat> I already used this term a little bit, cultural landscape. It's just a real big term in the field of geography, as you can imagine. Uh, Natural landscape that has mod been modified by humans reflecting their cultural beliefs and values. But the cultural landscape, don't just think of it as only natural landscapes. Cultural landscape is any landscape that humans have affected and changed. So, you know, when you're walking around the campus, that's a cultural landscape that human beings have had uh, that is conveying specific messages, right? Even norms. <clears throat> Identity. How humans make sense of themselves and how they wish to be viewed by others. <clears throat> um, I would say the other thing that we'll study in, in all these chapters are, uh, well, when we're looking at the, the physical landscapes of the world and that fight between cultures, there's actual changes that are happening all the time. Sometimes. These are in wars, by blowing things up, you're affecting that cultural landscape. And very often when new places kind of come into an area, an empire or whatnot, <clears throat> um, some of the first things they'll do is try to change the, the cultural landscape. They'll go to maybe a house of worship that was on the preceding empire's belief group, and they'll demolish it and build a new one specifically on top of it. 
I would say, I don't know if a lot of you have traveled much, but once you start traveling, you'll see this a lot. You'll see this a lot. Uh, great big palaces that were for previous empires, right? Well, the new empire, they will specifically want to have a discourse that says, actually, we're on top now. Our thing is at the highest point. Our thing is the, the most amazing building that is here now. <clears throat> um, usually empires, there's big efforts to not just change the cultural landscape, but a lot of the things that, that convey culture around. So for example, um, well, when there was a, a war in, in what was Yugoslavia, uh, the Serbians, when they were going and <clears throat> basically invading different areas that were Islamic, uh, they would specifically go to the libraries and they would attempt to destroy historical, historical documents that show that Islamic populations had been there for many, many years. They were hoping that they could kind of do a, a collective erasure of them culturally, right? Uh, and that's not unique to that conflict of those people. That is something that actually invading armies very often do. They'll try to completely destroy the culture that was there before, or at least signs that it was there. Uh, because, well, there, there's usually a need to, to try to make it feel like that current culture that is in place, that is actually a very temporary thing, uh, but was there forever if you destroy all the evidence of other histories, right? Um, this is the picture from the book as a representation of the cultural landscape, and it is... Uh, I think this is a kind of one of the more uh, common examples that are usually used in geography textbooks. They'll have some, uh, well, there's lots of areas of the world that, you know, you want to have farming, uh, but there are, the land isn't made for it, and so humans, through, through blood, sweat, and tears, carved out the landscape into something that could be farmed. Uh, this is a classic example. They're not usually illuminated like this, of course, but... <clears throat> Some more key terms, ethnicity, state or blind to a group of people who share common cultural characteristics. As you can see, the, the definition is a little vague because it's kind of up to ethnicities themselves to self-define or not. Because uh, you could have a place that seemed like a unified ethnicity and there can be some internal cultural force that will break them apart uh, and when they're broken apart, they will kind of evolve in different ways. Their, their language will change, their religion might change, all kinds of things could happen. Ethnic neighborhoods, cultural landscapes within communities of people outside of the areas of origin. <clears throat> uh, and there are a lot of these kind of worldwide, right, including in the US. Um, you know, when, when uh, you have a mall that goes in that's, a, that's an Asia mall, uh, we have one of those here in the Twin Cities. We have a number of these different little communities. Um, this is very connected to the earlier concepts that we studied about migration, step and chain migration, is you'll have a, a, a community that will start to kind of evolve as you get more and more people from one immigrant group into an area. Uh, and they will kind of reshape that area as a small version of, of what they had at home. <clears throat> Architecture, uh, we'll actually go into a lot more detail on these when we get to the chapters on urbanization and whatnot. Uh, traditional architecture versus something like modern architecture or postmodern architecture. Um, traditional agriculture, well, since these are much older, they're usually much more tied to, to rural uh, lifestyles, to, to farming and things like that. Um, <clears throat> modern and postmodern architecture, uh, well, are, are kind of the opposite. And one example that we have locally is the, the Wiseman Museum that, well, these days it's looking a little wore down maybe. I don't know, do people like this type of architecture, postmodern architecture? People not like it? It was pretty controversial when it went in. A lot of people, well, it didn't look as kind of tattered and worn and stained, uh, and so people kind of thought of it as, as an interesting use of space. I will say that the difficult thing about postmodern architecture 
postmodern architecture, what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, <clears throat> well, traditional, uh, traditional architecture, you know, with your hallways and your rooms and your windows, we want to just change everything up. But realistically, uh, that's not how people really kind of inhabit spaces. Um, you know, if this room had some weird big part there and some weird, you know, it's like, well, maybe there's a thing here, I guess, but there's, we really, really don't utilize it that much. Uh, the Walker Museum is another example of postmodern architecture. Very often the effort is to really convey something on the outside uh, and, and it doesn't really change the uses on the inside. Uh, and so, like I said, for this one, they're trying to say, that we're in a modern age, right? This is, has a very steel look, um, mirrored surfaces. I would say a lot of modernist architecture has lots of mirrored surfaces. Again, to kind of try to say we're high tech, we're innovative, we're, we're different from the old way of doing things. <clears throat> Landscapes of religion. Um, I probably don't have to define religion for you. Um, but I would say, well, when it comes to landscapes of religion, these are, these are change more than you might think. They change more than you might think. Uh, <clears throat> if you've ever been like walking around downtown St. Paul or Minneapolis, for example, uh, or, or near their outskirts, you might notice that there's like many different very little churches just kind of all over, and a lot of them are very old. Uh, a lot of them are boarded up, a lot of them have been changed to different uses. Uh, well, that's because earlier in the, the settlement of Minnesota, uh, there was immigrant groups, and every different little immigrant group from every different little kind of place uh, would have their own specific church and denomination and whatnot, uh, and there were so many that they were just kind of all over, but through time, those populations uh, <clears throat> well, they, they kind of assimilated into kind of larger religious categories. Uh, and eventually, as we went to kind of the suburbs, and we got kind of mega churches, kind of great big churches, uh, a lot of those old, smaller churches just are not used anymore. People have moved out from that area. Landscapes of language. Um, <clears throat> I think I don't have to explain what a language is either. Uh, but I would say one of the terms in this chapter, uh, toponyms. Toponyms are kind of an interesting thing because usually when people think about specific places, they don't think about why something is called something. Um, but it can be a, a, a very temporary cultural thing. Uh, so for example, well in the US, uh, <clears throat> When, when our economy was largely agricultural um, and it was mostly small towns just kind of all over, uh, well, if a, if a city wanted to seem important, they would often just put city in their name. And so they'd be like, we're Carson City. We, are, we have a city in our name. We're going to be the happening place where everything is going to be, you're going to want to live here, right? It's like, oh, Kansas City. It's like, oh, the city. <clears throat> It was a bit of a market, marketing ploy, right? It's like, did it work? Kind of mixed. Well, as the US kind of moved from being uh, central city focused to more suburbanized, uh, there was actually a lot of anti-urban bias and urban places started kind of getting bad reputations as being dangerous and whatnot. Uh, and then a lot of suburbs specifically, they wanted to change their names to things that would be more appealing. So for example, they would say, well, let's just put park at the end of our name, right? So Brook Brooklyn Park, right? Whatever park. Uh, or they would say, let's put heights in the name so that we sound really fancy, right? We're Columbia Heights, right? We're the best of the best. And again, those only work to some extent. It's like, well, Falcon Heights, it's nicer than some areas, but it's not like the height of living. Toponyms. <clears throat> Actually, not going to do that. Landscape features in identity. <clears throat> well, this picture from the book, 
Um, you know, probably you might find it quite unusual that you would find, <clears throat> well, a public transportation that is woman only, right? Um, could evoke a lot of different thoughts and feelings. In this example, well, unfortunately in a lot of places, in, in a lot of the world, there are places where women are just not safe, where they're harassed and, and worse, right? Um, and so this was an effort to try to make, uh, you know, to use the term, a safe space, uh, a place where women could know that they would go and they're not gonna have guys harassing them. <clears throat> uh, Matt from the book showing property rights and law, right? Property rights and law and <clears throat> practice for women. Well, what does that mean and whatnot? Well, there are places around the world where uh, a woman has more or less control over their bodily autonomy, right? It's like, well, who's making the decisions? And it, 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 depending on what culture you're from, the thought that your father would make your decisions after you're an adult seems like not something that, that would be the norm, but it's the norm in lots of places, or the husband, right? <clears throat> and so looking at the geography of this, uh, and if we also look at um, life expectancy, right, which we were looking at the earlier chapters uh, of how long people can live, well, life expectancy is, is quite correlated with this type of factor of, of how much control women have over their own bodies legally, right? Uh, well, the more control, the, the older of an age on average you live to be, right? And that usually is one of those measures that we take in when we're looking at development in our places more or less developed. <clears throat> Land resources and identity. Um, <clears throat> basically, what this section is talking about is, well, Earlier forms of agriculture had to be sustainable because otherwise the people would, would die out, right? And so they were usually lower scale, uh, tended to be more hunting and gathering, this type of thing. <coughs> um, well, those usually represent a different kind of value for the land, right? If we look at, for example, a lot of indigenous populations when they're hunting and gathering, uh, there's an amount of respect for those resources. Well, in modern day, capitalism and agriculture, uh, it's really just considered you got to maximize how much money you could extract from that land you have, right? Because you're competing with other farms who are also maximizing, uh, and so they will take as much out of the land as they can. Sustainability isn't that much thought about, right? Different values for that land. <clears throat> Gendered spaces. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of this is also things you already know, but um, when we're looking at gendered spaces, there are places that are more supportive uh, or restrictive, right? The example of having uh, a woman only way to travel uh, so that they're not harassed by men. Well, the, the harassment of men is a restrictive mechanism. That is something that that society does to restrict women, right? And even though there's fights against it, because there's always fights in cultures, uh, back and forth. <clears throat> um, yeah, I would say worldwide, um, as I've traveled, <clears throat> it's, 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 it's very, uh, well, I still can't get used to it when I travel, but you'll travel to places and you'll kind of go to a market or something and you'll notice that it's like, it's all men. There's no women anywhere. It's like, well, what's going on there? It's like, well, that's the harassment aspect. It's like, well, the women go there, they get socially sanctioned with harassment and stuff. And so that's why, and, and being taken out of being able to, to uh, engage in the public forum, right? That's a control mechanism. It's like, well, the amount of that it's cultural and it kind of depends on the place you are. <clears throat> Some of these terms we've used already. 
And a lot of them, I'm sure you know at this point, uh, gender identity, one's in our most concept of self as male, female, or blend. Safe spaces, which we talked about a little bit. Spaces of acceptance for people sometimes marginalized by society. Safe spaces are very broadly defined. Uh, gentrification, renovations and improvements, conforming to middle class preferences. Uh, <clears throat> you may be wondering, well, why is that topic brought up in this chapter? Because um, it's people will kind of get confused with this term because they'll see the kind of gent in that and they'll think, is this a gender term? And it's not really. Gentrification comes from the, the term gen, the gentry, which is basically people who, who used to have royal blood and so that they would have a space that was theirs by birthright. And so well, why does that have this term gentrification? Gentrification in most respects refers to, <clears throat> if you have a, a, a poor neighborhood, for example, that may be down on it, on its uh, luck economically. <clears throat> you could have people who want to come in and buy properties and fix them up, right? Uh, and in a, if enough people do this, that area could be revitalized uh, and it could be economically kind of viable again. <clears throat> and you would you might say to yourself, well, why is this controversial? Well, what happens is is the property values go up. The locals who have been living there for maybe generations, they can't afford to live there anymore because the costs have gone up, right? And it's like, well, on the one hand, they could, they could sell their house if they own it and get more money than they would have otherwise had, uh, but it displaces poor people who then have to find a new place to live. Um, <clears throat> why is it connected to, to gender identity and whatnot in this, in this context? Uh, very often, a number of these neighborhoods when they were fixed up, uh, it was by a bunch of people who wanted to create a, a bit of a safe space. Uh, and they had hoped that the whole community be, could be revived. I would say locally, the main example we have of this, uh, <clears throat> I think it still is, Loring Park, Loring Park in Minneapolis, right? It's like if you're gonna go to Pride uh, Festival and whatnot, that's the, the neighborhood that it's from. And that is a neighborhood that was uh, in, in a disadvantaged uh, inner city area. And you had a bunch of people who went and went to fix it up. Uh, and they also, at the time, created it there. There was lots of like gay bookstores and things like that, coffee shops. Uh, and it did actually bring that area, revitalize it quite a bit. <clears throat> Sense of place and place making. Uh, well, <clears throat> as it says there, a sense of place when people fill a location with meaning, connecting it with memories and feelings. Uh, people do this all the time, right? Uh, people have places that are special, places that they make special. Could be your home where you're from, could be a place that you like, could even be natural landscape has a specific meaning for you, right? Um, <clears throat> place making process in which community collaborates to create a place where they can live, work, play, and learn. Um, I would say, well, during the pandemic, there was a lot of kind of place making that was going on because all of a sudden, for a while, everybody was doing kind of outdoor activities, right? And so all of a sudden, a lot of parks that in my kind of fallen on bad times and hadn't been used much, suddenly everyone is out walking and, and doing things and using them again. Uh, and a lot of people during the pandemic, they developed specific fond feelings for those different places that they would be. Even if they don't hang out there now, they still think of them as, as these places that they were able to, as kind of a refuge. <coughs> Here's me. Still have the last little bit of this cold that just won't go away. Uh, language in a sense of place. Um, well, languages uh, themselves get their start from dialects, right? Dialects that have slight changes to the way people kind of speak in different areas, and then they kind of evolve through time and get more and more different. Uh, but they start as slight variations. 
I showed a map earlier of kind of soda and pop and whatnot, and that kind of, that was a replication of larger kind of societal divisions of, of how we talk about things and how we speak. Um, you know, the, the pop thing being, well, I would say it's not the full northern area, it's just more the central northern area. <clears throat> uh, religion and senses of space, of place, well, actually, I sense everyone's attention way flaying a little bit. So, we don't got a ton of time left anyway. I'm going to have you work on stuff in small groups. We'll finish up this chapter next time. <clears throat> so it's a lot of definitions, a lot of stuff. But, a couple of questions for you. Come up and do the card thing. There should be enough time. And hopefully, you think through this stuff will get you to know these concepts a little better. Attendance because all my cards got out. All right, who has hearts? Who has hearts? Hearts. Uh, there's kind of a cluster of hearts in that back corner. Who has diamonds? Diamonds. <clears throat> diamonds. How about there's NPCs here? How about diamonds there? Who has clubs? Clubs. How about clubs over back there-ish? Clubs? And who has spades? Who has spades? Uh, maybe over here, spades, since there's empty seats? <clears throat> All right, just a couple questions for you. If you got questions about the questions, let me know. I feel free to look up these terms if you don't remember what they were from the reading.